All right, folks, I think we're going to go ahead and get going here. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here with us today. My name is Jordan Grimes. I'm one of Greenbelt Alliance's Resilience Managers, and we're really excited to bring you uh, this panel on the Builder's Remedy, uh, which, as folks will learn, kicks in uh, tomorrow. It is a huge, huge deal for the Bay Area, um, and we'll be talking with several uh, advocates and experts about what exactly it means. We have with us today, former Redwood City Mayor Giselle Hale, uh, herself a longtime housing advocate uh, and who previously served on the Association of Bay Area Governments uh, as San Mateo County's representative. We also have with us Yimby Law's legal manager, Keith Diggs, uh, himself a housing advocate and expert, as well as Alex Contreras, uh, a housing advocate, expert, uh, previous uh, member of California YIMBY and previously with California Department of Housing and Community Development. So we are going to get going. All right. Uh, so before we get going today, um, just a little bit about Greenbelt Alliance and our organization. Um, we're an environmental nonprofit uh, whose mission is to educate, advocate, and collaborate to ensure the Bay Area's lands and their communities are resilient to a changing climate. Um, land use is a hugely important part of what we do here at Greenbelt Alliance. Uh, sustainable and resilient communities can only be created uh, through sustainable and resilient land use policy. Uh, that means policy that favors urban infill over exurban sprawl. Uh, that ensures we have the sustainable housing that we need uh, to really create an environment that everyone uh, can live and thrive in. All right, so the Builder's Remedy, this is what you're all here for. Um, some of you probably know what the Builder's Remedy is. Uh, some of you probably are wondering, what is this thing that we're all here to talk about? Um, and it's actually very simple. It's a provision of California state housing law. It's a provision of the California Housing Accountability Act. Um, and really what it does is it grants a streamlined process to developers in cities that don't have a compliant housing element. Um, housing elements are the state mandated plan, the blueprint for how cities will actually achieve the new housing growth that they need. What does the builder's remedy actually do? This is the interesting part. Um, the Builder's Remedy allows developers, builders, uh, those who are actually creating the housing stock that we need for our growing societies uh, to basically sidestep local zoning rules, things like height and density, things like parking minimums and development standards, um, allowing them to create projects that they couldn't in normal circumstances. The Builder's Remedy is really a emergency tool. That's what we're talking about here. Um, I think, as everyone probably knows, the Bay Area, California at large, are in a horrible housing crisis. Uh, there's quite simply is not enough housing to go around. That is directly due to decades of poor land use policy, um, both at the city and state level, leading to an all-time low of available housing units for folks who need them. Um, the Builder's Remedy is an in case of emergency break glass type of situation. If cities do not have a certified housing element, a certified housing plan certified by the state, uh, by the end of today, developers will be able to bypass or build outside existing zoning rules uh, as long as at least 20% of the units proposed in the housing project are provided at below market rates. So in order to really fully grasp the builder's remedy, um, what it is, what it means for uh, both California and the Bay Area, we have to talk about the housing element. Um, and as I mentioned before, every eight years uh, in California, cities and counties have to submit a plan to the state demonstrating that they can actually meet the targets uh, or likely are likely to meet the targets that the state sets out for them. Um, to actually build. Uh, that plan in particular is known as the housing element. 
this cycle, this eight year cycle that uh, the Bay Area is in and is currently going through is very different than it has ever been before. Um, very, very different than previous years. Significant changes have been made to state housing law uh, during the last five, six, seven years, as well as new requirements uh, that have come into play by the Department of Housing and Community Development at the state, which have made the housing element a much more effective avenue for pursuing policy changes. Um, in particular, uh, some of those things uh, include SB 167 by Senator Nancy Skinner, which strengthens greatly the housing accountability, the housing accountability act in ways that it has not been previously. Uh, it also includes bills like AB uh, 686, uh, which is around affirmatively furthering fair housing by assembly member Santiago in the Los Angeles area. Um, it includes uh, provisions like SB 35, uh, Scott Weiner's bill to streamline development in cities that don't have uh, that have not met their housing requirements, uh, their state housing targets. Um, all of these things coming together provide really a perfect storm for cities. Um, really make it much more difficult to uh, both meet housing targets and really force cities to look at the plans that they've made in the past. Uh, look at past development trends and look at how they're going to plan for housing in the future. How does the builder's remedy factor in? The builder's remedy is a unique situation, um, one that has never really been tried in California before. Um, as, I, as I previously mentioned, the housing element process was really a paper exercise before this. There really weren't any penalties. Uh, and now we have one um, that is quite unlike anything California cities have seen before. Um, the loss of local control under the builder's remedy really gives advocates unprecedented leverage to pursue more equitable and sustainable land use policies across the Bay Area. Um, what we're talking about are urban infill policies, policies that make it easier to create the dense housing in the areas that we need it in, um, in the Bay Area's cities and suburbs uh, near transit, uh, close to good jobs in high resource areas um, that allow more people uh, of all income levels to really enjoy uh, the Bay Area the way the rest of us have. All right, so we're going to get into some specific discussion topics today, um, really drilling down on what the builder's remedy is and what its implications are for the Bay Area. Um, as I mentioned, the Builder's Remedy goes live in many Bay Area cities, uh, in fact, almost all Bay Area cities tomorrow. Um, cities have a statutory deadline of today, of January 31st, to have compliant housing plans. Otherwise, the Builder's Remedy uh, is one penalty that goes in effect. We will talk about some of the other penalties that cities will uh, experience for not having compliant housing element as well. We'll also be discussing how advocates specifically can use the builder's remedy to push for land use reform that's really necessary for creating a more sustainable and thriving Bay Area. Uh, and then lastly, hoping that there are uh, members of uh, staff from some cities here today, we'll be talking about what cities can do to avoid the builder's remedy. Um, most cities aren't looking forward to losing land use control. And actually, there are a lot of things that cities can do. Um, they're in fact not all that difficult to really ensure they have the strongest uh, housing elements possible and ensure that they actually meet HCD's compliance standards and allow them to uh, avoid the builder's remedy. And so, as I mentioned, we're very lucky to have uh, three all-star panelists with us today. Um, I am going to kick it over to Keith Diggs first from Yimby Law to really give us um, some background on the Builder's Remedy, what it is, uh, how it's used, how he expects it to be used, um, and what we can expect to see over the coming days, weeks, months uh, in the Nine County Bay Area. Um, so Keith, welcome. Really looking forward to hearing your perspective. Sure. Thanks, Jordan. And uh, nice of you to call me an expert. Um, 
I, I don't think anyone's really an expert in housing element law. It's, it's a 41,000 word statute and that in and of itself is a problem. But the, um, the builder's remedy has been on the books since 1982. Um, and Jordan's absolutely correct. It goes into effect all over the Bay Area tomorrow. And we're really trying to publicize it here at Yimby Law because um, we do have a serious housing crisis. And um, you know, anything we can do to legalize, especially affordable buy right housing in urban areas, we've got to push forward with it. Um, so I, I don't know how many builders remedy applications are going to be filed tomorrow. A um, couple interesting things. We now know which cities the builders remedy will apply in. Um, you can go to yimbylaw.org slash builders remedy. Um, any city, I, I grade cities with emojis, uh, so any city that has a house emoji or a clown emoji next to it uh, will be subject to the builder's remedy. A um, couple interesting patterns around the Bay Area. Um, a lot of San Mateo County jurisdictions are pursuing uh, what some of you may have heard of as the self-certification strategy. Um, in a rush to avoid the builder's remedy, I think. Um, you know, there, there's some other justifications uh, that can be put forth for rushing into an adoption. Um, but there's a really interesting contrast happening there with Santa Clara County, where uh, most of the big cities have had their first draft housing elements rejected by HCD. And rather than rush to adopt and, uh, you know, in this frenzy to avoid the, the specter of buy right affordable housing, um, most of the cities are taking their time and respecting the process and trying to get their drafts right. Uh, if you account by RENA, 81% of Santa Clara County will be subject to the builder's remedy tomorrow. Um, so I think that's super exciting. Now, um, like I said, the builder's remedy has been on the books since the early 80s, so it's not like this is the first time it's been available for use. Um, there, there's a dynamic in, in modern land use law where developers do not want to cross the cities they work in. Um, and that has a lot to do with, uh, I think, why we haven't seen builder's remedy applications before. So I'm really hoping that tomorrow is different um, because we need housing. I, I'm calling from somebody else's attic. I got priced out of Phoenix last spring and I'm sleeping on an air mattress right now. Um, so, you know, and I know I, I'm not alone. I actually have it quite good um, compared to a lot of people who have been priced out. Um, but, you know, I, I'm a little worried because uh, if, if we do not see Builders Remedy applications tomorrow, then I, it raises some questions about uh, what, what good it's for. And um, I, I think some bigger questions about how we need to change land use law in general. So I'll stop there. Fantastic. All right. Uh, I think we'll go over now to Alex Contreras. Um, and by the way, folks, uh, we're just doing a couple quick minutes with, uh, with each panelist, and then we'll have some questions for them as well. And if you have any questions, uh, do feel free to use the Q&A. That is what it's there for. Hey, Alex, welcome. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so Alex, as I mentioned, uh, has previously worked for uh, both California EMB and California HCD, that's the State Department of Housing and Community Development, and so they have, uh, in my view, a particularly unique view of uh, really the housing elements process um, and what the builder's remedy is going to mean for California cities, uh, specifically in the Bay Area. Um, Alex, could you just tell us a little bit about, you know, what when it comes to when it comes to compliance? Um, Keith mentioned that only a couple cities in the Bay Area, um, you know, are are in compliance right now. Can you talk maybe a little bit just about what uh, HCD is looking for and what you know you as an advocate look for when you're um, talking about housing elements and and compliance? Yeah, I think the biggest thing this cycle that ha that has been a lot of challenge for a lot of staff and a lot of cities, as well as for the HED itself, is affirmatively furthering fair housing. Um, that is unique in the sense that it is cities didn't have to have an AFFH section before. And so this is like the first cycle that the state is really looking into what goes in this data. And a lot of times as a reviewer, uh, you would sort of see a city like, oh, well, we have this data, we have this information, and that's kind of it. There was no, there, there was no, okay, A, B, but how do we get from point A to point B? 
why is this particular city very affluent, predominantly white? There was no explanation as to where that where that's going, where where or why that happened, and how the city can then make sure that it breaks the pattern of historic segregation via whether it was by race or by class. Um, and so I think that is a big struggle right now with a lot of cities, uh, uh, especially I advocates have also been very on the nose with it, I feel. Um, and and I one thing that I think advocates can do and what they should be doing is very, making their points to make sure if you're gonna send a letter, make sure you're not only sending it to the city itself, but also send it to the HCD reviewer. That, then, that letter then is taken into consideration for their review. So for example, if you are an advocate and you have a concern about the AFFH section, sorry. It's a lot of words, a lot of letters, I mean, sometimes I get it scrambled. Um, for example, if you're concerned about this and you think that the city can be doing better um, or you wanna help staff connect dots, uh, make sure that you're not only sending that letter to city staff, the city itself, but also make sure you're sending it to the reviewer. In other words, it's not gonna be taken into consideration when the reviewer, like someone like myself, then writes the letter back to the city. Um, but I would caution against over you, over sending letters because as a reviewer, you are, it's a lot of work and there's not enough of you. Um, and so those letters should be used sparingly and they, they should be short to the point and as clear and direct as possible with as much references to like page numbers within the housing element um, but the AFFH section is definitely something that's challenging cities and the state, uh, and there needs to be more legislative guidance around what it is that the HCD should be looking for, connecting the dots, because um, currently that doesn't exist. And so it's very much up to cities and the HCD, very individual discretion at the, at the, on behalf of the reviewer as to what flies and does not fly, uh, if that makes sense. But yeah, that AFFH. AFFH section has been definitely been the biggest thing that I've noticed that's causing a lot of just challenges and how are you going to tackle the question of what does meeting these requirements mean. Um, so that is the big that is the big one. Fantastic, Alex. Thank you. And uh, just a note for all the advocates out there, brevity is appreciated by HCD reviewers. Uh, know that. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I'm really excited now to introduce uh, former Redwood City Mayor Giselle Hale. Um, Giselle has been a staunch housing advocate uh, for many, many years. Um, as I mentioned, uh, served on the Association of Bay Area Governments uh, as the San Mateo County Rep, uh, and is from of one and is from one of only four uh, Bay Area cities that that currently uh, is in is in substantial compliance on their housing element. Um, has developed a housing element that met HCD standards. Um, and we are very excited to get her take on how Redwood City got there um, and how other cities can do that too. So welcome, Giselle. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Well, it feels a little bit late to be giving advice, uh, but we can certainly talk about how we got there and what you could do uh, as a part of a city starting really today, uh, because the next cycle is in seven years. Um, so it's kind of interesting because likely, uh, you know, the councils that you have in your cities today may not be the same council the next go round. So what could you be doing now to ensure that you'll be successful with that with that next round? Um, so, you know, what you should know is that in Redwood City, housing is already the number one strategic priority uh, by our council. And that's something we adopted over two years ago. So we've already been aggressively tackling housing as uh, an issue. So we really just embraced the housing element process starting all the way back in April of uh, 2022 uh, with study sessions with our council and community input. Uh, we had a planning commission review and then we had our adoption. And we did receive feedback on our first draft from HCD and we resubmitted. Uh, and now we are on the substantially compliant list, which basically means that we will be certified. And very surprisingly, we're in a very small cohort of only uh, four cities. Um, so what did we do? You know, I think a few things. First of all, and, and I've always felt this way um, as a policymaker, as an ABAG member, we really talked about people more than units. We talked about people 
and what were the needs the community was going to have. And they're outlined very clearly up front in our, in our housing element. It was looking at millennials. Uh, it was looking at seniors and the very specific types of housing needs they were going to have, um, you know, generational trends, uh, numbers of those generations, who were we going to need to house? We looked at overcrowding. We had a lot of data on overcrowding coming out of the last um, uh, census. So we didn't focus on the units. We focused more on the people, but that was already something we were doing with every project. We were looking at the type of housing we needed to build to fulfill the needs in our community, not checking a box so that we could, uh, you know, not face the builder's remedy. It was already about people. Um, I personally wish uh, the RENA language better reflected that, and that's something um, maybe for another uh, another panel, another time, but I think it would really help with the narrative in the communities. So you're not doing this to fulfill an exercise for the state. You're doing this to fulfill the needs of your residents. So that said, we did hit our units goal. Um, so we actually went far well above and beyond. We targeted 150% of the required RENA, which is around 6,800 uh, homes. So that, and we do that, and a lot of cities do that so that we have a buffer because at the end of the day, the cities don't actually, most, most of the time, don't build the housing. So you have to ensure that you've set up the right uh, environment and parameters to make it such that developers would want to build uh, in your city. And so you need to have a little bit of buffer there. Um, it was not all smooth sailing. You know, in addition to the feedback we got from HCD, we heard from advocates about challenges and specific with our affordable housing ordinance that we really took to heart. So as mayor, I set up time with them, with our staff, so that we could find solutions. Because to me, at the end of the day, I don't want the good grade from HCD. I want the housing. I want the need to be met in my community. So if my partners from the nonprofit um, housing, you know, affordable housing community have a problem, I want to solve that. I want to eliminate that barrier. And so we really use this process as a, as a forcing function for that, to make sure that we were all on the same page and we were creating the kind of environment where, where units could be built. Um, we already have 1,400 units approved already, starting today, day one. And we have 2,100 proposed. So Redwood City, we're already well on our way to fulfilling our goals. Our adoption meetings, I can tell you, were completely non-controversial. I want to say maybe one speaker came. In fact, there have been more Redwood City residents at the Atherton hearings than there were at the Redwood City hearings. We could maybe talk about that later and why. Uh, but the point is, if you've done your homework, if you've talked about housing again and again and again, if you've educated your community, if you've listened to them, this can just be a simple assignment. Not an easy one, but a lot easier than what you're seeing play out in other cities in their meetings this week, uh, in their town halls and on Twitter. Thanks, Giselle. I, I think really when it when it comes down to it, something something you said, you know, sort of at the at the beginning of this conversation, um, you know, city is really looking at this uh, being about people rather than units, I think is really important. Um, that's something I don't think we have seen in most jurisdictions. I think in most jurisdictions, um, you know, advocates have really seen cities, um, you know, really trying to do the bare minimum, uh, trying to meet a unit count rather than trying to actually house people. And I, I do think, you know, based on what we've what we've seen in Redwood City, and obviously HCD would agree, um, you know, that uh, that method in particular um, has really has really led to a, a plan that is um, not only compliant, but substantial um, and effective at, at creating uh, the housing that the, that both the city and the and the region need. Um, I did have uh, just one question. I'm I'm you know sort of curious. Um, really, you know, I, because we were talking about the builders' remedy here, um, there are a lot of cities in the Bay Area. Um, you know, in fact, uh, probably about 97 of them right now um, that are that are worried about the builder's remedy. Um, and and certainly, you know, I, I think um, prior to uh, what happened in Santa Monica and and for those who aren't aware, uh, Santa Monica also did not have a certified housing element. The Southern California cities are in a different 
uh, timeline than the Association of Bay Area Government Cities. And so we sort of had a window into uh, what was going to happen in, in ABAG for quite a while. Um, and in Santa Monica, after uh, they did not have a compliant housing element, they received 14 different builders remedy projects. Um, and so, you know, more than more than half of uh, Santa Monica's, you know, eight year arena target um, is already, uh, you know, sort of met with these uh, with these 14 projects. Um, to wit, now that this is happening, I think a lot of Bay Area jurisdictions all of a sudden are, are a little bit concerned, uh, maybe more than a little bit concerned about what the builder's remedy is going to, you know, is going to lead to in, in their cities. As a, you know, sort of former mayor, as, as someone who sat on, on a regional board, um, what would you say to those cities now who are staring down the gun of the builder's remedy? Um, you know, sort of what what advice might you give them um, that Redwood City did that they could potentially do right now to get into compliance? Yeah, I mean, look, it's like the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, right? The next best time is today. That's really what these cities are facing. Um, you know, we can all get bent out of shape about this potential threat and the loss of local control through the builder's remedy, or we can take it as an opportunity to learn and grow. And I think that's exactly what the call to action should be for cities that didn't reach compliance. It should be, what is it that we need to do differently? You know, learning from cities like uh, like Redwood City, but like the others. I mean, and we're actually a very different cohort. If you look at the four that made it, it's like Redwood City and San Francisco, which are very different on housing, right? But we have been talking about housing nonstop for well over a decade. You know, we participated in something that the county put together called uh, Home for All Discussions, where we brought in a think tank on how you have the housing conversation within your community in ways that people can hear it. We brought people together. We brought together landlords. Um, we brought together, you know, people who are being squeezed out to sit at the same table, to share their story. And the climate now in Redwood City is just simply different than what you see across the peninsula. You do not see people um, coming and protesting. Now we we did, you know, when I was on the planning commission eight and a half years ago, uh, that was the norm. It was signs and stickers and stop and and like those people have basically accepted it. And I think in part it's like sort of exposure therapy. We did so much building, right? We built 2,500 units to our downtown precise plan. And there was the fear that you probably see in your communities. And then it happened. And like, guess what? We're, we survived, you know? It's like getting through a home remodel. It's terrible. It's awful. And then you get through it and you're like, oh, I really like this kitchen and bathroom. So, um, you know, we have all the same issues that other communities are facing in terms of economic development, um, in terms of so many other issues, but we have sort of broken through that fear factor by taking those steps forward and showing people, hey, and then there's some positive benefits too, right? We can we can support more restaurants. We can, it's a more vibrant downtown because we have more people. Um, so so it's sort of a much ado about nothing now. So the real solution is you got to build. So once you start, it just becomes a lot easier because you've you've taken those first steps and people see, okay, we can do this. You need to start today. You need to not wait for another assignment, another, you know, another deadline. You need to start today. Thanks, Giselle. So the advice there for city is boiling it down, rip the Band-Aid off, uh, make the changes you need to get a compliant housing. Go order. build something. Yeah. <laughs> We will we will talk a little bit about what those changes are um, momentarily. I do want to move to the uh, Q and A portion now because we have quite a number of really good questions in the Q and A. And folks, if you uh, if you have something you want to see here, please do go ahead and uh, submit. Um, Keith, I want to throw this one to you because I think this is a this is a really good question. Um, the question is from an anonymous attendee, but it is. Is there a difference with respect to the builder's remedy between being in substantial compliance and being certified? Um, this is, you know, one of those procedural things um, that, you know, uh, would be would be great if we could get an answer to. Specifically says the HAA says a housing element must be in substantial compliance, doesn't make a mention of being certified. Um, you know, this would this would 
reduce the number of cities that the builder's remedy would be successful in. Can you talk just a little bit about um, the difference between substantial compliance and certification? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I love housing so much that I agreed to do nothing but housing element law for about a year. So uh, here, here's the answer on that. Um, HCD certification is not the exact equivalent of substantial compliance. Uh, that often gets lost and it's really confusing the people who are new to housing element law. It's, it's really unfortunate because like Anytime I talk to a reporter about the builder's remedy, I want to be simple about it. And they're like, well, what about this? And I'm like, it's not, just not simple. Um, all right. So HCD is required to review every housing element. And they have to make a finding as to whether HCD thinks it's substantial compliant, substantially compliant or not. Substantial compliance is actually a question of law um, that you can only really find out. It, it's kind of like Schrodinger's cat, actually, is the best analogy. Um, you have to litigate to actually determine it's like an objective fact if a housing element is substantially compliant or not. Um, HCD certification is the best readily available proxy there is, so that works for most purposes. Um, and But like, you know, if you talk to a lot of uh, housing element wonks, they'll they'll inevitably bring up this 2007 California case where HCD rejected a housing element and then a court found it substantially compliant um, for reasons I, I don't need to get into here. Um, so yeah, um, uh, sorry, I've been like sleeping five hours a night for a while, so I lose my train of thought. Um, all right, substantial been compliance. A little bit busy. Yeah, not the same thing as certification. Um, so the easiest way to tell if the builder's remedy applies is simply if the jurisdiction hasn't adopted a housing element by the deadline. Um, so that's the main basis of most of the predictions we're making. Actually, I think it's the exclusive one. Um, now, in any city that decides to self-certify a rejected draft where HCD has pointed out 20 pages of problems with its housing element, which we're seeing all over the Bay Area, um, I, I think there's an excellent argument that uh, that housing element is not substantially compliant. And um, I, I'll have more news on that in the next week or so, I think. Um, actually, I can already talk about this. We've already gone public saying we intend to sue Redondo Beach, which interestingly, HCD certified, um, but we think their site inventory doesn't meet the, uh, the requirements for non-vacant sites, which is you know this one little, little portion of housing element law. Um, so yeah, that, that's the long and short of it. The easy way to tell if the builder's remedy applies has nothing to do with certification or compliance. It's just if the city hasn't adopted the housing element. Um, that said, it's a good idea for a city that hasn't gotten the certification to just get it right and get the certification because that that is a good indication that the city is in substantial compliance. Perfect. A very well thought out answer. Thank you so much, Keith. All right, uh, I'm going to throw it back to uh, Giselle now for a question from Susan Baldwin, um, who would like to know whether Redwood City has an inclusionary housing, housing ordinance um, to ensure that some of the housing is affordable to lower income folks. Uh, Giselle? Yes, I've we do. I um, actually worked on that when I was a planning commissioner. So there was previously a law that prevented uh, those uh, ordinances. Uh, and as soon as it was removed, we added it. Uh, we added inclusionary zoning. We have 20%. Um, it does break down by type of uh, affordable, and I don't know offhand what it is. I'm sure we could both Google it and find out. And, um, you know, it's it, it's an important part of uh, our mix. There are no silver bullets in housing. So the 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 gold standard is literally do all the things. Um, there's a great chart on, uh, I think it's the Housing Leadership Council's website that shows every possible housing strategy a city can have. And Redwood City is like completely across the board. We have implemented everything. Um, so if your city hasn't done that, I would say add it to your toolbox, uh, but don't stop there. It's not the end all be all. And you can also take it too far. It could be used, uh, it could be weaponized as a way of actually avoiding development because it could be made uh, totally you know, financially infeasible if you, if you go overboard. So it's about uh, hitting the sweet spot. And there are firms that specialize in the economic analysis to help your city pick the right amount. 
Awesome. Thanks, Giselle. One other, you know, just while we're while we're on the topic of Redwood City, I, I want to point out a couple other, well, one or two other things that I that I really love about Redwood City's latest housing element. Um, and you know, things that I I think our advocates would love to see. Um, specifically, there is a uh, streamlining provision for new 100% affordable housing developments. Um, this is, you know, something that I that I think a lot of cities can and, and should pursue, um, and really does help with um, the the development timeline for for low income housing. Um, stretching, you know, stretching the timeline out years and years is one of the biggest impediments to the construction of affordable housing, um, and just want to you know, really uh, appreciate Redwood City's um, commitment on that. Can I just say something really quick about that? A lot of people focus on funding for affordable housing. Focus on time. Focus on time because time is money. And so uh, we spend so much time thinking about zoning and thinking about the funding. Think about process as well, because if you can cut down that process, you actually save money and then you don't need to go to taxpayers and get more money to spend. So that's the free money. It'll also help your staff. Two cents. Going to chime in as working for the HD, one of the most depressing things is seeing a affordable, a hundred percent affordable housing development lose its funding because of the timing that it takes from like the start of the process to actually pulling the permits to actually building. Um, I saw that happen more than once, and that if you're a city who's trying to get into sort of get into compliance making sure that you streamline the funding. Don't make people go, make, make, make it electronic. Make everything electronic, submit things electronically. That cuts down in time a lot. That, so that way people don't have to be printing things out, going to the counter. Um, but there are a lot of little easy things that you can do within your housing element to make sure that you go into compliance and cut down on the timing. So that way you don't lose out on affordable projects within your city. Fantastic. Thank you to both of you for those answers. Um, I am going to go uh, back to you now, Alex. Um, two very quick questions. The first uh, is from our friend Nico Nagel at the Housing Action Coalition. Nico would like to know how folks can find out who their city's housing element reviewer is. Uh, probably, I meant I meant to answer this uh, in the chat, but I actually hit answer live by mistake. If you go to the HTD website, at the top they have a little search button type in housing element reviewer and it's gonna, and the first link that will pop up is the housing element review and compliance report. So that way then you get to, then you see the all of what's happening within the HCD, who's in compliance, who's not, what the status is. You just click on that button, the arrow button one more time and it lists all the names of the reviewers of who's reviewing that city's housing element. So that's how you do it. Um, other words, I'm so sorry. I would love to drop the link in the chat because I did pull it up so that way people can see it. Easy peasy. Thanks so much, Alex. And this is a really great question that I think a lot of advocates are sort of thinking about right now. Um, assuming a city gets certified or once a city gets certified, assuming that happens. Um, I'd like to think that everyone will be certified at some point, um, but given Southern California, many cities still aren't, who knows? Um, but once the city is certified, what can we do? I'm assuming the uh, anonymous attendee means advocates here um, to hold communities accountable um, and really to hold cities accountable to their housing element commitments um, on implementation. How do we ensure that the you know policies and programs that cities are um, putting in their in their housing elements, um, you know that they that that cities are following through on those commitments and, and that they really are creating the, the housing stock that we need? That is a very good question that I would like to answer in two parts. Sure. Um, first, if that is something that you would like to do, understand that that is a very heavy workload and you are going to need a lot of folks who are going, you're gonna need someone who's gonna come home through the housing element programs probably create a spreadsheet of like what the program is, what the program does, what the timeline is. So that way you yourself and your organization can keep track of that. Second, making sure that you cities know that you are aware of what the programs are and what your expectations are of city staff, city electeds. Oftentimes city, it's city staff usually isn't the problem. It is city electeds most of the time when it comes to accomplishing what the programs can do. Um, because even from a reviewer standpoint, many of the programs language can be still very vague. 
So it's up to electeds to how far they want to take it. So making sure that you're keeping track of the data, like what's happening, what's where, what does the program say, and to making sure that you have a very strong centered community push around what you want to see out of that specific program to make sure that the cities are allowing housing to be built. Because this is like reminder to everyone, cities aren't required to build the housing themselves. They're just required to make sure that the housing can be built. So those are two very different things. Um, so yeah, making sure that you have a strong housing advocate presence within the city with city electeds as well. Um, yeah, th that's probably a two-parter, and that's probably that's that would be my best advice. Um, we'll no, that was that was great advice, Alex. Um, for for you know every for all the for all the advocates out there who are you know who want to see uh, all these things implemented, um, make sure your city council, uh, your planning commission knows who you are and make sure your HCD reviewer knows who you are too. Um, cool, thank you for that, Alex. Uh, oh, wait, me... second part. Oh, I totally, this slipped Please. my mind. Go, go for it. So, a, so one of the things that I was in charge of while creating, uh, while working at HCD was creating uh, our own internal timeline of programs to make sure that they are going to be implemented to ensure that the cities stay in compliance because fun fact, the HCD can revoke your compliance if you're not going to be following along with these programs. So that is a very that 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 is a very serious thing. I don't know if any cities are that's going to happen, um, but that is a very serious move that the HCD can take to say, "Hey, we're serious. If you're not going to be in compliance with the housing element, we will revoke your compliance." Um, which can, I guess, that's a legal question. Can that then kick in the builder's remedy after the fact? Um, and so, uh, so yes, I'm getting a nod from Keith. Uh, so that is all, so that's something that's also happening. So making sure that you yourself are internally keeping track, creating a good relationship with your reviewer. Don't bug them too much, but like <laughs> let them know that you are also keeping an eye on it. Um, we'll make sure that internally uh, HD is aware of what's also going on on the advocate side. It is good to have good relationships within the department if you're an advocate and vice versa. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. All right, we will move back to uh, a couple more builders remedy specific questions now. Um, Keith, this one's this one's headed your way. Um, despite right. this process being new and unprecedented, what do you all think about the usage of the builders remedy? Wondering if nonprofit developers will really move to use it, considering the strifes that could be made with their council and board of supervisors, um, and thus future opportunities for funding and projects. And how much do I think builders remedy is going that to might be a good one for you to sort of chime in on on as well? How much do I think it's going to get used? Um, you know, basically, it's do you do you think that um, you know that nonprofit developers will will use this? Um, do you think that there's a chance of this being used? I guess is how I how I would phrase it. Um, I I wish I had an answer. I I don't know. Um, I. I think it makes sense, but I, I do not, you know, nonprofit development requires Frankensteining all these funds together and working with federal agencies and state agencies. And that, that's like a whole job that I've just never, I have no experience in. Um, so I, I do not have a very good feel for how afraid nonprofit developers are of uh, annoying actually basically getting blacklisted uh, by their city councils. I've, I've heard from a couple who are who do have this fear. This um, is a political question, Keith. Let, yeah. I'll let the lawyer off the hook. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I don't think it'll happen, right? Because for exactly that reason, you're gonna you're gonna upset elect the electeds in that city. What I think is more likely to happen are uh, pulling aside a staff member and saying, hey, um, you know, there is this thing and that could be used. And what we see in Redwood City is oftentimes we have a nonprofit developer, they're partnered with a for-profit project. That's how we've done a lot of the financing. Um, so that that could be the angle. It's sort of the for-profit could come in and say, hey, now um, that's where I think we'll see it used. I think it's going to be, um, I think it's going to be done by uh, for-profit developers more so than nonprofit developers. By the way, my pro tip for any council member, new council member, I just talked about process. Also, you need to learn about financing. Financing is so key. You always hear uh, you know, candidates talk about, uh, 
yeah, I want to, you know, we need housing, housing. Okay, cool. Finance is how you make it happen. So sit down with, grab coffee with a nonprofit housing um, developer, and they will explain to you the crazy layer cake of funding that they have to bake in order to make one of these projects feasible and everything that hangs in the balance to, to make that happen. Um, it's, it's absolute sorcery and it can be very educational. Fantastic. Thank you, Giselle. Um, Keith, I will, I will kick this one to you. We actually have, uh, someone in the chat, Jesse Bristow. Hi, Jesse, uh, who has a proposed 90 mixed use townhome project in the city of Livermore. They're working on their second round submittal and the project requires a zoning change. They would like to know if they could resubmit and move the project forward under the builder's remedy. So we have a potential, uh, we have some potential interest in the builder's remedy here, right here in the chat. Provided the project meets the affordability requirements in subdivision H3 of the HIA, yes. And what are those affordability requirements, Keith, just for everyone's edification? Uh, it is, it is, don't quote me on this, but it, it's close to this. Um, either 20% of the units can be designated for lower income or 100% of the units can be moderate income. And that is one of, I think, several different definitions of affordability in various different parts of California housing law, but that's another webinar. Awesome. Thank you, Keith. And best of luck to you, Jesse. Um, all right, I will kick this one over to Alex. This is this is more of an existential question, I think, for all of us. Um, do you all think the RENA is high enough? The regional RENA is the reason, regional housing needs allocation. Um, and this is something that I think housing advocates uh, debate quite a bit. Do you all think the RENA is high enough? Um, wonder if you all believe that uh, six to 9,000 units over eight years is enough to make housing affordable in a city with so many high wage jobs, so many more high wage jobs than housing units. Um, that's that's a really great question. I think this is something, you know, that that, like I said, advocates go back and forth on. Um, I should also note that Rena is considerably higher than it ever has been before. Um, thanks largely due to uh, San Francisco State Senator Scott Wiener's uh, Senate Bill 828 uh, from 2018, which really uh, tweaked how um, the state looks at housing need, uh, specifically incorporating vacancy rates, um, what a city's vacancy rate is, uh, among uh, other factors like overcrowding that, that weren't considered before. Um, so already, you know, Rena has gone really from uh, and Giselle, correct me if I'm wrong. Redwood City was at like 2,000-ish units, you know, in the in the prior cycle, and is now required to build, you know, considerably more than that. Um, but there is a question of is is Rena enough, and should we be doing something different? Um, simple answer. My how I how I like to answer this is no, but I also like to share an anecdote as to why the Rena number isn't high enough. Um, we're going to take my hometown of Downey, which is just over 110,000 people. So it's a decent sized city. In my graduating class, there's two high schools in Downey. In my graduating class, there are roughly 900 people at one high school who graduated in one year. At the other high school, there's roughly about 900. So let's say, let's just round up, let's say 2000 high school students graduated, have graduated every year for the past 10 years. That, and our arena number was only for this upcoming cycle was just under 7,000 housing units. Assuming half of these kids don't want to stay in Downey, they want to leave, they're going to move to other parts of the city. Maybe they're going to move to other, other cities. Maybe they're going to move to other states. Is that enough housing to accommodate the graduating high school class? It simply isn't. So take that number and then go stretch back 30, 40, 50 years, because we have been underbuilding in the state since the 1970s, really. The arena numbers are not high enough to catch up with where we need to be. Um, it's not high enough to catch up with the graduating high school class within the next 10 years of every single high school kid that's going to graduate because let's just say half of them want to stay in the city and let's say half of them want to even move in with their friends that's still not going to be enough housing to accommodate the high school graduating class let alone college graduating class let alone people who are moving here for work let alone families that are growing like it's simply the arena numbers haven't been high enough they are considerably higher this year for the cycle round, but they need to be much higher and cities need to be doing much more. 
Um, that's what it comes down to. If your city is not building enough housing to accommodate the high school graduating class every single year, they're not doing enough, period. That is a fantastic example, Alex. Thank you. Um, and and it's it's something something I think about as lot uh, think about a lot as well. Um, my my own hometown of of San Mateo, uh, which remains to be seen if we will get any builders remedy projects, uh, given our our decision to self certify, um, has a similar issue of graduating about twelve hundred high school students every year uh, and producing on average about a hundred homes. Um, not exactly a, a recipe for, for success in, in that arena. Um, I am going to uh, kick it back now to Keith because we do have um, a couple other uh, builders remedy specific questions. Uh, someone asks whether uh, we think that cities will use CEQA to slow down or stop possible builders remedy applications. Uh, so I will throw this one over to you, Keith. I'm um, really glad this question came up because this was like, you know, something I wish I'd mentioned at the last one. The Builder's Remedy does nothing about CEQA. Um, so if you're thinking about a Builder's Remedy project, talk to a CEQA lawyer. I'm not a CEQA lawyer. Sorry. Um, here's a quick rundown on CEQA. San Francisco is really the only place that uses C that really the only city that uses CEQA as a weapon. Uh, typically, a city is actually the defendant in a CEQA action. Um, so depending on uh, staff, and you, you'd have to feel this out with the staff in whatever city you're thinking of, um, they may be willing to work with you on, on uh, you know, certifying you for one of the various exemptions that can apply to different projects like urban infill, um, sustainable communities. There, there's a handful. Um, and we have several uh, webinars on this topic on our Builders Remedy website that I think was linked earlier. Um, with uh, Holland and Knight attorneys, and then Brian Winter of uh, Miller Star Regalia, both both of whom are CEQA pr practitioners and have great advice. So if you're wondering about CEQA, check those out. Awesome. But typically, the opposition is going to come from like some some other group in the community, not the not the city government itself. Gotcha. Thanks, Keith. Um, and this is actually a really great question. I'm sorry I'm giving you two in a row here, Keith, but I, I, think, this was, I think this one is really good. Who is responsible for enforcing the builder's remedy? Um, if the city ultimately refuses to approve, can any group pursue litigation or does it have to be done by the attorney general's office? Ah, excellent question. Uh, the AG's office can do it, um, which I, I maybe HCD has to refer to the AG's office. I'm not sure. Um, the applicant can definitely do it, and a housing organization that uh, submits oral or written comments before the city takes action on the preliminary application can do it. So if you're thinking about a builder's remedy project and you want EMB law support, let us know so we can get a letter in so we have standing. Great, very, very important point there, Keith. Um, I would I would be remiss if uh, if I didn't point out that there, um, quite a number of, of other uh, housing activist groups that are, um, you know, sort of doing this work, uh, the California Housing Defense Fund, Californians for Home Ownership. Um, so there are uh, quite a number of um, sort of activist groups that are getting involved in these types of, of lawsuits. So if you do uh, have a builder's remedy project, um, those, you know, groups are, are good to get in contact with. Um, let's see, we have a couple other really good questions uh, in the chat um, that we'll try and we've got really just time for about one more before we, um, you know, before we uh, have to end our session today. Um, and I'm going to just sort of bring up this one. Um, People are working. Uh, this isn't this isn't sort of this isn't really a question, but it's, it's something that I'd like I think us all to think about. Um, people are working. They might not be able to attend all meetings. Access is not as easy as people think. Housing is important, and people do want to participate across cities um, on affordable housing. So I I would say I think this is important. Um, you know, Alex, from from your vantage point, I know that HCD has. Um, requirements for public input on the housing element process. Um, and I'd love to, you know, Giselle, get your, uh, you know, get your thoughts on public participation as well. Uh, Giselle, did you want to tackle this one first? Yeah, I guess the question is, 
what is the question for me? Like how? Yeah, it's just really how you think about public input, how people can get more involved, even when they can't Got attend, it. you know, a five hour long city council meeting uh, study session on housing element policies. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I'll just say this, that the post uh, pandemic world has done everything for public process and participation, right? Because because you have the ability to dial in and that didn't exist before the pandemic. And so we do see that a lot now where um, where people interested in a specific item may be keeping others informed uh, and they're just logging in for that item. They're not having to sit through a five, six hour meeting and, and good for you for not having to do that. Um, I will say, you know, uh, writing in is good. Um, showing up is is great. It is really helpful to have you come and actually show that you took the time. And it is a lot easier to do that now. Uh, we know that's not feasible for everybody, um, but but letting people know, no matter how short or long, is super important. And I did share in the link to one of the questions the Home for All website, and it does have a toolkit for how you can host these um, sort of, I would call it off-cycle discussions that are not just related to a specific task like the housing element, but are related to how you talk about the housing needs in the community. Highly recommend checking out those resources. And from the HD perspective, sending in your public comment to the city, let's say you can't make a meeting, but there are things that you want to say about the housing element process, please, please, please do email those to the city because we will see them and we will be able to garner information out of it. Because trust me, people, uh, people from all kinds of backgrounds are sending in their, sending in their uh, comments to the city. So make sure that your voice is also heard that way too. So even if you can't attend a meeting, but you have a very, like you have thoughts, you have opinions, you have knowledge, make sure you send that information in. Because if you're gonna tweet about it, it's a, just a tweet, HCD is gonna see that. So make sure that you send in that, uh, send in that public comment to the city. Awesome, thank you, uh, Alex and Giselle for those final thoughts on public participation. We are just about at time. Um, so I wanna take just a moment now to uh, thank all of our fantastic panelists uh, for your expertise, for your advice, uh, for your opinions, for uh, sharing all of that with us and the attendees today. Um, thank you for, for everyone who decided to spend your lunch hour with us talking about a very wonky topic uh, that uh, is appreciated by a uh, few, um, but hopefully more in the coming days, weeks, and months. Um, we really appreciate you spending your time with us. Have a wonderful rest of your week, and uh, we'll see what happens with Builders Remedy projects in the near future. Thanks for hosting us. Bye. Bye, everybody. Good to talk with you, Keith and Alex. Thanks Thank for hosting. You.